Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Amber Idol. I'm the Washington State Veterinarian, and I'm here with Dr. Kevin Snekvik with WSU Waddle. And we thought what might be the easiest for this group is if every week we give you a series of updates on what's happening with HPAI and livestock. It seems like this rapidly evolving situation is evolving so quickly that every week we have new information and it's really hard to stay on top of. So we're going to make weekly recordings, post these and send them out for distribution so that we're all on the same page. So you can look for your next update either this Friday or next Monday, depending on how much new information we get. I'm gonna go ahead and start the presentation today, followed by Dr. Snekvik. And I'm gonna give just some high level updates about what we're seeing out in the United States right now with regards to HPAI. I wanna start by saying, we don't have any cases here in Washington state. So that's really good news. And I hope that every week we do this update, I can continue to say the same thing. All right, so first I'm gonna start out with our overview of the national situation in poultry, because I think it's really important for us to not forget that HPAI is a poultry disease and that we need to be monitoring the situation in our commercial and backyard flocks to maybe even understand also what's happening with HPAI and dairy now that there is that link of transmission. So since the beginning of this outbreak in the last two years, we've had 48 affected states with over 1,100 premises affected. And most recently in the last 30 days, you can see on the map at the right is the number of uh, states that have been impacted either in commercial flocks or in backyard flocks. We've had 10 commercial flocks, six backyard flocks. Idaho and California would be the ones we would be most concerned about. And both of those had backyard flock detections, which have now been dealt with and are in control areas now. So you can see here, these are the two states that I just mentioned, um, and they are part of, you know, 646 commercial PREMS and 489 backyard PREMS to date for what we're seeing with HPAI. But we definitely haven't seen as many cases as we have in previous years. In Washington, we continue to be HPAI free in both our commercial and backyard flocks and haven't had a detection here in the state since December 19th. We are up to 46 total flocks in the state, which is one of those being a commercial flock. So kudos to our commercial poultry producers who are keeping it out. Um, so now I'm gonna transition over to what's happening in, with HPAI and livestock. So just as a reminder, you know, HPAI is a poultry disease. It's highly pathogenic in poultry, so it causes a lot of mortality and morbidity in poultry. But in domestic livestock, it's much more difficult to find because they're really not highly pathogenic in those animals at all. So since, the, since March of 2024, USDA um, announced that there's been 43 premises in nine states that have had positive detections of HPAI in livestock. And you'll see the states that are outlined here. And you'll see that in red, those are affected states in the last about uh, since May 5th. So they've had new detections. And the ones that are in kind of that off white tone haven't had detections since prior to, to May 5th. So this is kind of your one week update. So in the last week, this is what we're seeing. On this bar graph, you'll see the epidemiological curve for presumptive cases, and you'll see in the last week there's been those four new premises, um, and then prior to that, you'll see sort of the curve here. So what we're trying to do is get ahead of this, find out where those herds are, and prevent further transmission. Um, and so part of that federal order was trying to get some additional data to better understand, you know, how prevalent this disease really is. This is the HPI confirmed domestic poultry detections. And I just wanted to bring this up because again, when we're looking at this map, we're looking at 2024, we're just seeing, you know, not as many detections in commercial poultry operations, which is a really, really good thing. Um, but it's not such a good thing that we're continuing to see detections in, um, in our uh, livestock operations. So as you know, HPI, HPAI in cattle, presents in a very vague way. So the description of clinical signs are here. Um, this is a USDA graphic. And mostly it's just a decrease in milk production or feed consumption. And some of them have this abnormal colostrum-like milk. So we just wanted to continue to let people know to look for these clinical signs on farms, whether you're a producer or you're a veterinarian. And all of the farms that have had detections to date have had clinical animals. It might not be very many. You know, a lot of these herds only have, you know, maybe a 1% to a 20% morbidity rate, maybe some of them less. So you may see very few cows that actually become clinical, but we know that a lot of these herds have asymptomatic animals. 
so they look clinically normal. So we really ask our veterinarians to lean in and really pay attention to what they're seeing on farms and not to be afraid to, to test for it and find it. The quicker we can find it and contain it, the faster we can eradicate it from the U.S. cattle herd, which is really what we're trying to do. There's more and more epidemiological information being collected. They still aren't exactly sure how all the transmission is happening, but what they do know is that cattle movement is definitely playing a role and there is likely mechanical transmission because this is really just, you know, it's pretty um, localized to lactating animals. This virus really seems to like the mammary gland and there's good reason to believe that we may be transmitting this through uh, milking units. Um, we also think that there might be an opportunity for milk, the virus could be aerosolized from milk. That's another way that it's thought to be transmitted. But nasal swabs are really showing very high CT values and aren't thought to be playing a very important role in disease transmission. But we also know that there's evidence of lateral transmission. This is the big question mark in trying to understand what's happening. Could be humans, it could be traffic, it could be shared service providers, but it's certainly something we're concerned about. And Dr. Snekvik is going to talk to you more about the whole genomic sequencing data to show how this particular virus in livestock seems to be from a single point source introduction from wild birds. So although that they're persistent carriers of HPAI, we don't think that they're continuing to start new infections in herds um, across the United States, which is a really good thing. But it means that this virus has been really successful in transmitting itself between a lot of different premises in a pretty short period of time. So the idea is that this virus was likely introduced last fall sometime, and since that time we've seen it move around. And we know that one way it's been able to move is through importing infected cattle. So this is um, a nice graphic from Michigan. They've done some great epi work there to show, you know, where cattle were introduced from and where they were sourced from. And all of them here, at least those four, had introductions from other states with known affected premises. But there are these two there that didn't have introductions of new animals from affected states or affected herds. And what they were trying to show here are the relationship of those epidemiological factors that have increased the risk of disease transmission. And that's included wild bird and wild animal exposure, visitors with cattle contact, and that can include veterinarians, nutritionists, hoof trimmers, breeding technicians. So those people that come to do the DHI testing, there's a lot of the same people that are on these different farms. So we really need to be thinking about that human component to disease transmission. Also shared trucks and trailers like milk trucks, feed delivery trucks, dead stock removal trucks, people that are bringing bedding or feed are all common sources of infection on these farms, which is concerning to think that, you know, that's a breach in biosecurity, but it's also could be preventable, which is really important for us to think about when we're thinking about breaking transmission cycles. And interestingly, on two of these, there was shared poultry and dairy workers in one household. So, you know, a husband or wife or family member, one worked for the poultry industry, one worked for the dairy industry, and they showed farm to farm transmission between dairy and poultry. So that's also concerning and something that we need to continue to be aware of. We also need to really be thinking about biosecurity and every week, I feel like we say the same thing, but getting those secure milk supply plans out is really, really important in implementing those enhanced plans to pre prevent disease transmission, because now we know that breaches in biosecurity really are contributing to lateral spread of this virus. So there are things we can do. Probably the most important thing you can do is not import any lactating animals at this time, even with testing. If there's any way around that, don't do it. I would also say another great thing, don't move any lactating animals onto your farm, even if they're from somewhere else in the state. If we can just move dry cows before they're lactating or springers, great, but let's not do it after they've calved, if at all possible. So again, what we're most worried about here is that spillover event or the evolution of the influenza A viruses. And we're really concerned about that next global pandemic. At least our, our Department of Health partners and CDC partners are working really hard to prevent that. And they're continuing to make recommendations for PPE. I did see a really interesting webinar about a week or so ago, and it doesn't look like pigs are, can even be experimentally infected with this particular strain of virus. So the swine industry is leaning hard into this because we all know that pigs are sort of that high risk uh, mechanical mixing vat for lots of influenza viruses that could later contribute to more of a zoonotic transmission pattern. But right now it sure looks like swine do not seem to be susceptible, which is awesome news considering how many other species are. 
Um, we know that the, the risk um, to public health remains very low. Dr. Snekvik is going to show you where they fit on that whole genomic sequencing tree and kind of where the branches are. But right now, there doesn't seem to be any changes in genetic markers to that virus that would make it any more transmissible to humans. Um, but what we are doing is trying to still promote this idea of wearing PPE is always a good idea, both for HPAI, but for lots of other zoonotic diseases that we see on farm. Um, our Department of Health partnered with us to put together this nice infographic that we can distribute both in English and Spanish so that farm workers are sure that they have the PPE that they want and they need. And so there is free PPE available to anybody who want it upon request, and we can certainly get you in touch with uh, local health jurisdictions or you can contact your local or state public health jurisdictions and they can help you um, get the PPE that you need for farm workers. FDA has been a little slow on updates. I just checked it this morning. I'm not seeing a lot of new information, but for those of you who haven't seen it, there's been a lot of testing on the commercial milk supply, including sour cream and some other dairy products, and they have come up negative. Initially, they were pulling uh, retail milk off the shelves, and I think about 20% of those were coming up positive. But what they found is, is on the PCR was actually picking up unactivated or inactivated viral particles. And after doing virus isolation, really found that, you know, those, those samples were negative. So that's really good news for our commercial milk supply. Uh, FDA continues to state that drinking raw milk is risky. Definitely don't consume raw milk from sick cows or any cows exhibiting clinical signs, but in general, just not a good idea right now to drink raw milk. Um, inherent risk with doing that. Um, and then also there's been a lot of tests done with FDA on meat and meat safety. Right now we're seeing that there's um, the ground beef sales. Um, they've, they've taken some, some samples from retail ground beef and they found that those samples were all negative in those affected states. So areas where you might expect to see more beef that might have been exposed um, when they were a live animal. And they've also gone to some slaughter facilities where 11 establish establishments with call dairy cows, which represents about 60% of the US cattle population, they sampled there and they sampled both muscle and lung tissue and they were negative and they were actually pulling out cattle that were condemned at slaughter. So they're picking out very high risk looking animals from affected states to try to make sure that we have a good clinical picture of what's going on. And to date, looks like that that ground beef is safe. Um, and I saw that they're doing another study looking at different temperatures with um, infected meat and trying well, like they're, I think, like experimentally infecting the meat and trying to make sure that cooking it at different temperatures would still kill the virus. Um, but I haven't seen results of that yet. We are still waiting for those. Um, so as you know, the federal order was implemented on April 29th, and that required mandatory pre-movement testing for all lactating dairy cattle when they move across state lines. So it's mandatory testing for interstate movement. And then also they wanted to require any herds that test positive to provide epidemiological information because we have these huge gaps in data. And then finally, there was a requirement for all laboratories to report non-negative influenza A results because they were seeing non-known laboratories or those private laboratories doing testing and not reporting. So just a good reminder that we do need those private labs to do that. I think USDA is saying they aren't getting any reports from private labs, and that's very concerning, especially with the federal order in place. And then just this morning, we were on a call, and USDA announced that they're looking at a voluntary program, so a voluntary testing for intrastate movement of dairy cattle. And so they're still unpacking exactly what that looks like. But we, I think really what they need is to build some more surveillance data. So they're asking for our help. So if anybody wants to volunteer to do, to do some surveillance testing just to see where you are in this process, we can do that for free. Um, but, but we do have to also consider that there are going to be some repercussions with you know, having a positive infected herd. But what's important, I think, for our whole industry and what we really need to lean into is, is we really don't want HPAI to get established in livestock. It's just another thing for us to manage for. So I really think what we need to be thinking about is what is our ultimate goal with this? And it sure sounds like USDA is taking the lead to say that, hey, we want to eradicate this from the U.S. dairy cattle herd. And the only way we can do that is if we beef up our surveillance data. And the only way we can do that is if people lean in and they start doing more testing so we can get more information. So right now, what I'm hoping is, is that this infection can really be, um, you know, confined to those 42 dairies that are already infected and it doesn't go anywhere else. But there's certainly a lot of concern about how this virus is moving and continuing to move. 
we have the spreadsheet put together and it kind of, for those of you that work at markets or you're just your private veterinarian or your producer and you want to move lactating animals either in or out of the state, this is a nice decision tree that I can send you. Just email me and I'll send it to you. We can also post it along with this webinar so you have access to it, but it might help you to make better decisions about when you need a test, when you don't need a test, when you need a CBI, when you don't, when you can use an alternative document like a hauler shipper statement or not. And so happy to help work through this decision tree with you as you're kind of moving through trying to make the right decisions um, for cattle movement across state lines. And then finally, last Friday, Secretary Vilsack had made an announcement and there was a press release that USDA is able to financially support infected herds. So if you're not an infected herd, you do not qualify. But once you have that positive result, they're really trying to help producers to stay viable and not go out of business. So they're able to support producers by paying for biosecurity planning. They can pay for um, heat treatment prior to milk disposal because we know that you know this virus is pretty hot in the milk. They can also reimburse any veterinary costs associated with having to manage this or do sampling on, on farms. They can also offset shipping costs. And of course, they're gonna pay for testing as they are now. And Dr. Snekvik will talk, talk more about that. And then obviously they want to do all the things they need to with regards to PPE to provide PPE and provide any kind of um, protective gear needed for humans or farm workers to protect them from a public health pers perspective. Here's just kind of the outline of what they can provide for each of those different categories. And I'm hoping that no one on this, this webinar ever needs to know how much they qualify for, but I think it's up to $28,000 per herd. Um, which I'm sure we can all burn through quitty, pretty quickly on an affected herd, but I do give USDA credit for trying to at least lean in and help support producers through this incredibly stressful and difficult event. As you know, the USDA has a landing page and you can get on there every day and they do have updates on there. They also have updated guidance documents, particularly around moving of slaughter cattle. There's been a lot of requests to to remove that free movement testing for slaughter cattle. And so far we have not been successful in doing that, but I wanted to just bring this to your attention to check this regularly. Cause like I said, we are getting updates um, to those documents weekly for sure. And we'll try to keep you apprised of what those updates are. Just a last minute plug here for the bovine issues working group, who's continuing to work on behalf of all of our cattle sectors across the state. We've had great representation and leadership. Um, especially with Jackie Medill, who is uh, our Beef Commission representative, who's kind of keeping this all coordinated. But we are working hard on your behalf to make sure that we get this right for our industry. And we, we um, all encourage you to reach out to any one of us in your representative organization uh, to get your questions answered. And now I'm going to hand this off to Dr. Snekvik, who's going to take on the laboratory component of HPAI and livestock. Yeah, so there we go. All righty, Dr. Idle, just want to make sure my screen, you see my slides okay? Perfect, looks great. All righty, so moving on to the testing side of things. Um, so the Washington Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab doing uh, is your non tier one known lab for the area. So just so you um, do realize that you know, we have two laboratories, one in Puyallup and one in Pullman, our avian health and food safety laboratory in Puyallup. Um, focusing obviously on our avian producers over there. And for the last two years, we've actually been working um, hand in glove with our producers on high path avian influenza and dealing with that. So unfortunately, this is just kind of an expansion of work that's already been going on for the last couple of years. So just to um, kind of go out to the national level, the NOM, the National Animal Health Laboratory Network is a Lab, a network of laboratories, uh, state laboratories across the United States that are tied to the USDA and doing surveillance work for a variety of diseases that was actually coordinated initially for foot and mouth disease, but it's uh, coming up quite well, working quite well for the current high path avian influenza outbreak. And so the benefit of this obviously is all these laboratories are, are doing the exact same test. They're using the exact same machines and they're also using the uh, people are all um, equally um, trained. So how that helps all that information that Dr. Idle just presented to you is that all of that data across the entire United States is basically um, has the same underlying testing parameters so we can actually compare what's happening in Washington state with the Midwest and even to the East Coast. So what are we doing? We are doing real-time PCR testing. So that is actually looking for the genetic material of 
of the highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. Uh, we've worked with the federal laboratory to confirm that that our tests actually work in milk and in cattle, just as well as they do from chickens. And so the real-time RT-PCR test um, actually is a mul is multiple tests that we're using. So the first one that we screen with is called the uh, matrix. So that's actually just the the part of the coat of the virus, and we're looking for that gene, and we test for that because that that gene doesn't change. So we know it's not going to mutate off of that um, genetic segment. Whereas the other, the next two tests, the H5 and the H52344B, which is the current outbreak strain, those are the pieces of the virus that do change and mutate. So we want to make sure that we have the right, um, that we're looking for the right virus. So the testing that's been going on, again, this is um, uh, real-time PCR testing. We've been doing individual cow um, and milk samples. And the reason we're doing that is because that's where the virus is at. So when this initial situation arose in cattle, uh, there was a lot of different samples that were tested. We looked at blood and we looked at feces. We looked at a variety of things and really found that it was the milk where is where essentially all of the virus is at. So that's where, why we end up testing there. Uh, current testing numbers as of the uh, last Friday, uh, we've looked at about uh, 73 cows for interstate movement. So uh, we are working with multiple states, um, just with our proximity to Idaho, we're doing testing for them and Nevada. All of those have been negative, um, good news. And then we've also working on export testing. So we have uh, Washington clients that are trying to move uh, cattle up to Canada. So that's uh, the export there. And likewise, those have been negative. So um, great news on that front. So the clinical cases, these are cows that are have uh, reduced milk um, production and all the lists that Dr. Idle covered there. Um, those are the other cases that we're evaluating and, and we eventually send those off for confirmation at the National Veterinary Services Laboratories um, with the USDA and, uh, and getting that information back. And, and between what NVSL is doing, and what we're doing, we do a viral sequencing. And so the sequencing data really is helping us try to um, put piece together the epidemiology that Dr. Idle was talking about. And so what you have here, so just as a reminder, the sequencing is um, based on the genetic material of, of the virus. So we're looking at, again, um, the, the genes that are there, and in particular, what's called the hemagglutinin gene. And we look at that one because that is the, the genes that's really important for infectivity um, between species. So, uh, and what you're seeing on the right-hand side there is a publication that uh, just recently came out within about the last 10 or so days um, as a pre, um, a preprint, meaning it's on its way to being published, it has to be peer reviewed, but it's putting together all of the sequencing data that's across the United States. So this is multiple non-laboratories in USDA, um, putting um, that, again, bringing all this information together. What I really wanna emphasize here is you see the cow um, picture there with the, with the orange uh, line there. So each line is basically a virus, um, a, a viral sequence, and you can see that and those might be at different locations and definitely different animals. And you can see those branches is where it kind of spreads between different groups. And what you'll notice is a lot of the two thirds of that, the bottom um, is green and blue. And as you follow that line across, which is time. So if you look at the very, very bottom, there's a black line that says 2022.5, 20, 2023. 20, those are actual years going across there, the last two years that we've been dealing with this outbreak in poultry. And you can see all the introductions from wild birds, which are the blue, into our poultry, um, domestic poultry farms in the United States, which are the green. And you can see really that those wild birds are driving that spread of the virus. And then you see at one point, wild bird is spread it in, in that blue line changes to orange where it then invaded and went into cattle and then really kind of spread out from there so we're not seeing multiple um introductions of wild bird of the viruses from wild birds or other um, species into the cattle seems to be have occurred just at one point and that arrow there with the pb2 and np those are just genes and that there's mutations in those genes um, that correspond to that change right there and that it then goes into the into the cattle and you can kind of see then it spreads out uh, um, within the different cattle populations as as it's being spread around if we kind of zoom in and get a little bit higher level um, there the you know the concerning thing we're always worried about is what happens with other species and you can see the different colors there the the, the green for poultry and some mammals where 
there is evidence, genetic evidence there that there's a connection to cattle going back into these other species. And our concern there is that's called a, a spillover, a reverse spillover back from cattle into these other species. And we, we worry about that. Uh, the positive thing that I want to really highlight there is on nowhere on there is any of our human, uh, the few, very few human, human cases we've had. So we're not seeing in, in this genetic um, evaluation of really a risk to human. And then if you go over to the other picture on the right-hand side of your screen, where you do compare the sequence that was um, uh, detected in the one human, that it, it goes quite a ways back in, in the genetic tree there. So yes, there is a connection uh, there, but it's not what's ongoing right now. So that that's a really good news from a public health standpoint in my mind that, that we're not uh, seeing uh, uh, more and more um, human um, infections coming from that. So that's very, very positive. And going back to trying to corral this virus within the in the um, uh, cattle population and trying to get rid of it there. So what are we doing at the diagnostic lab? Just as obviously the testing, we have put up a web page for um, information. So with resources that people can find um, if they need testing help. So again, we're um, only doing milk samples at this point and working um, with veterinarians and producers to do that. Contact information there. So we have a landing page. That landing page then takes you to um, the variety of um, testing that is going on right now. So we have, obviously we're worried about our animals that are sick. So we have our different boxes down there at the bottom of the screen, which all those are hot linked um, to additional information in each of those areas of how we can help you out. Uh, in the case of clinical animals, obviously Dr. Idol would be involved with those, um, and and WSDA would be involved with most most of these type of cases. So we have our interstate interstate movement um, for lactating dairy cows. We're working on that testing. We're obviously still working with our poultry in industry very closely to um, make sure that we don't have uh, spillover events from the wild birds into those groups. And we have information there along the bottom as far as how to how to pack um, samples up to us, how to ship them to us, and that sort of thing. And then a hot link to get you back to those guidelines that Dr. Um, Idle was talking about, including the USDA um, uh, website that's updated daily. So just a, um, a shout out to our team here that put together um, a specific accession form to try to streamline samples coming in here. Um, this form is on that web page that we went back to. Uh, it's a PDF fillable form. Just highlight that really if samples are coming in uh, to give us a, a heads up uh, with a call or, or shoot us an email. Uh, really need to have premise, prem IDs or premises ID identifications submitted with those samples. Um, that's the only way we can do testing on them and the only way they get um, funded up as well. And these would be for um, interstate movement or export. So remember, we are working with producers for export um, into Canada um, to get uh, if you need to have cattle moving across the border there. Uh, as a heads up, we have a, a discounted shipping with UPS. So uh, quite, a, quite a deal. So next, always use next day air. We want to get those um, samples which are on ice packs, um, not frozen, but just on ice packs to us the next day, but at a really um, convenient price of $20 um, anywhere within the Pacific Northwest. So just so you, if you're getting ready to put things into the into UPS, um, uh, that's the route to go. And if you have questions uh, about any of this, give us a call and we're here to help you. And with that, I will shift back over to Dr. Idle. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So that is the conclusion of our weekly update. I really appreciate you watching our webinar. We'll continue to do this as long as we need to. So hopefully we won't have to do it forever, but we are prepared to do that. And feel free to reach out to Dr. Snackvik or myself. We'll put our contact information in the email where you've received the link to this webinar. And uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much.